On the morning of the 21, Thai was blindsided by a shocking announcement from the company's president. I was being let go effective immediately to make room for his daughter. This news left me speechless and at a loss for what to do next. It was a critical day as it was the time to make payments to our suppliers. While many transactions were handled via bank transfers, I personally visited some of our long-standing partners to make payments and maintain good relations. The president seemed eager for me to leave right away, even pushing me out of the office and swiftly shutting the door behind me. I stood there, confused and unsure of how to react. My name is Sophia, and I had been a dedicated data entry at this family-owned paving company since graduating high school, devoting 10 years of my life to my role. The company, with about 21 employees, had always had a positive work environment under the leadership of the then-president. It was a friendly place where even the retired Thomas and his wife, Victoria, who managed various office tasks, would actively engage with the staff, creating a warm and inclusive atmosphere. Lily, the Thomas's daughter, was skilled in both field and office tasks, and her husband, the account manager, was well respected by everyone. This family-led team never allowed their status to overshadow their respect for the employees, and the work culture was genuinely supportive and pleasant. However, the ideal continued operation of the company was disrupted when the Thomas was diagnosed with cancer at the end of last year during a routine medical checkup. He decided to step down, appointing Lily's husband as his successor. Everyone, including myself, supported this decision, wishing for the Thomas's recovery and a long life. Yet, reality struck a harsh blow when Luke, the Thomas's eldest son, whom I barely knew, suddenly appeared and altered everything. Luke received the news in the presence of his family that the Thomas, his father, had disowned him nearly three decades ago, an astonishing revelation that he was completely unaware of. According to some long-standing employees, Luke had been a troublesome youth, frequently clashing with the law. Each time he stirred up trouble, it was the Thomas and his wife, Victoria, who would step in to smooth things over. After he dropped out of high school, Luke delved into questionable businesses, including multi-level marketing and other dubious schemes, which eventually led to his disownment. Despite years of estrangement, Luke made a dramatic return, imploring his father for forgiveness and a chance to start anew, right in the midst of the small company office that doubled as both the president's office and clerical space. His plea was witnessed by everyone present as he expressed his desire to leave the past behind and contribute to the family business. Although Luke's intentions sounded sincere, his past actions made it hard for Lily and the seasoned employees to fully embrace his return. Nevertheless, when the Thomas advocated on his behalf, no one could deny the request. Subsequently, Luke and his family moved into the Thomas's guest house. Luke took up a role in the company, while his wife managed the household duties and their daughter. A college student occasionally visited the workplace. The Thomas was optimistic, suggesting that Luke's hardships had reformed him, and Victoria was visibly moved by her son's return. They were hopeful about rebuilding the business together. However, tension soon emerged as Luke claimed he should be the next president because he was the eldest son. His relationship with Lily and the account manager grew tense. Despite appearing diligent in the Thomas's presence, he was largely unproductive and even made inappropriate remarks, undermining his colleagues under the guise of authority. Luke's dismissive attitude instructing his co-workers to work in silence like worker ants rapidly alienated him within the company. The discontent grew as younger employees, unable to endure the toxic environment, directly appealed to the Thomas for intervention. Despite this, both the Thomas and his wife Victoria only offered mild reprimands to Luke, asking the staff to be patient and view the situation with a broader perspective. Complicating matters, the Thomas's health declined sharply due to stress or other factors, culminating in his hospitalization two months prior. Amidst this turmoil, Luke seized control declaring himself the president. This decision was against the advice of employees who favored the originally planned candidate, the account manager and son-in-law. Many murmured that the decision was a misguided show of parental affection, or worse, a sign of senility. This shift profoundly altered the once vibrant and cohesive atmosphere of the company, leaving it tense and uncomfortable. 
As tensions escalated, Lily and the account manager began orchestrating changes behind the scenes, leading to a shift in my workload. Previously, administrative tasks were evenly distributed among Victoria, Lily, and myself, allowing me to maintain a regular schedule. Now, burdened with these responsibilities alone, I found myself regularly working overtime, with days stretching into nights. Meanwhile, Luke seemed to trivialize my efforts, treating administrative duties as trivial while he indulged in leisure activities like visiting hostess bars by day and gambling or horse racing by night. Our relationship deteriorated further over financial discrepancies. Luke had been using the company's credit card for personal indulgences, which I had reluctantly overlooked until it reached an untenable level. The last straw came when he attempted to expense his wife's personal purchases, specifically corrective underwear, as a business expense. I confronted him, refusing the claim, which inevitably led to a heated confrontation. As expected, Luke reacted with fury when challenged, his face flushing with anger as he struggled to justify his actions. Don't cross me. She is the president's wife. It's only natural for her to look her best. It's a legitimate expense, Luke asserted confidently, trying to justify the exorbitant $5,000 spent on his wife's corrective underwear as a business expense. I was at a loss for words, struggling to understand how he could possibly see this as reasonable. His next suggestion was even more baffling. Let's just start selling corrective underwear as a new business line. Then it counts as a purchase, thus a business expense, he proposed with a self-satisfied grin. I stared back in disbelief. But we're a paving company, I reminded him, utterly confused by his logic. Luke brushed off my concern with a wave of his hand. So, we'll just tell our clients they must buy from us or lose their contracts. We'll make a killing selling these $3,000 a piece or $5,000 for a set. It's an easy business, he chuckled, seemingly pleased with his ingenious plan. I was horrified. That's absolutely unethical. It would completely destroy our company's credibility, I protested vehemently. My objection only earned me a spot on Luke's blacklist from that moment on, subject to his constant disdain and criticism. Life at the company became unbearable. Many times, I considered resigning, but my loyalty to the Thomas who had always supported me and my concern for the potential consequences on my colleagues and the company if I left kept me hanging on. Besides, abruptly losing my job would put me in a difficult financial position. I resolved to endure until a better opportunity came along. But unexpectedly, Luke fired me. If I resign without proper notice, it'll cause issues for our clients. I argued as I gathered the courage to open the door and confront him one last time. Even your daughter isn't ready to handle my tasks. And today of all days, when payments need processing, I added hurriedly, bracing myself for his reaction. True to form, Luke's face flushed with anger. Shut up. I told you to leave because my daughter is taking over. Today is your last day. As for the payments, let them wait. He snapped, dismissing me summarily, leaving me to face the harsh reality of my sudden unemployment. When they come to collect, there's no need to pay them proactively, Luke casually mentioned, dismissing standard business etiquette. I was shocked. Excuse me, isn't it basic practice to pay for something once you've agreed to buy it? I found myself explaining this fundamental principle as if I were speaking to a child, only to be met with a response so bewildering that I questioned his capacity as a rational adult. If that's how it is, just threaten to switch to another supplier. Tell them we won't make the payment this time, so they should give it to us for free. What? We can't possibly do that. I exclaimed, utterly dumbfounded by his suggestion. You're utterly useless, he retorted dismissively. My daughter has a college degree. She can handle the office work. Since she's family, she won't question my spending like you do. We don't need someone who's all talk and no action in our company. Get out now. In essence, Luke was planning to manipulate the accounting by having his daughter oversee it, thus writing off his personal expenditures as business expenses under the guise of administrative decisions. Oh, is that so? Just remember, I won't regret leaving, I responded, realizing that reasoning with him was futile. 
My patience had completely evaporated. I quickly gathered my personal items and left the office for the last time, but I still felt a strong concern for our clients. I immediately called Lily. I knew Victoria was preoccupied with caring for the Thomas, and that Lily was busy, but this situation was urgent. After explaining everything to Lily, I left it in her capable hands. Once outside the company, the reality of being suddenly jobless hit me. Being fired without notice was a clear violation of the labor standards law. Our company was registered under the Middle Company Payment System, a government-initiated severance pay system designed to support small and medium-sized enterprises that might otherwise struggle to provide severance pay. I knew I could claim my severance pay and one month's salary through this system, and there was no rush. I had three years from the date of termination to apply. Additionally, the statute of limitations for reporting to the Labor Standards Office was three years. Due to my meticulous nature and experience in office management, I quickly began calculating what was necessary for moving forward. After resigning and concluding the necessary procedures for my retirement, I realized I could afford to relax for a bit. Recently, the demands of constant overtime and weekend work had left me little time to enjoy personal activities or even tend to things at home. I had a long list of places I wanted to visit once I had more free time. So, I decided to start with a simple day trip to the beach to unwind and rejuvenate. While soaking up the sun at the beach, I checked my smartphone that I had left in a locker and noticed several missed calls, emails, and voicemails. Among the emails was a reassuring message from Lily, indicating that the payment issues had been smoothly handled and everything was prepared. I felt a twinge of relief and guilt. Even though Luke had abruptly fired me, I still felt responsible for my former duties. Next, I played a voicemail from the company, which featured Luke's panicked voice. Hey, what's going on? You're claiming I'm not the real president? Did you know this? Explain yourself properly. His tone conveyed confusion and frustration. I couldn't help but smirk at his evident disarray. I methodically went through my emails and voicemails, listening to each one. There was a voicemail from the Thomas too, which prompted me to visit him in the hospital that evening. When I arrived, not only was Victoria there, but Luke was there too, visibly agitated. As soon as the Thomas saw me, he greeted me from his hospital bed with an apologetic tone. Sophia, I'm truly sorry for my foolish son's behavior. Meanwhile, Luke was still trying to assert his authority, blurting out, Hey, what's going on? I'm not the official president? Explain yourself. The Thomas sternly silenced him. You be quiet. He explained that right after he had spoken with Lily, she had immediately informed him and Victoria of the situation. Upon hearing this, the Thomas had urgently called Luke to confront him. Facing a flustered Luke, who was shouting without fully understanding the gravity of the situation, I calmly laid out the truth. Luke, you never legally held any real power. You were president in name only. The concept of a president within a company might be confusing without the right context. In corporate terms, president is simply a title that signifies a role within an organization, not a position defined by legal authority. The person who legally represents the company and holds external responsibilities is known as the administrative assistant, which is distinct from the title of president. The designation of a president can be easily changed internally within a company, but altering the administrative assistant involved complex procedures and significant legalities. Two months ago, when the decision was made for Luke to take on the title of president, there was substantial resistance from Lily, the account manager, and the veteran employees. Understanding the potential complications and the legal framework surrounding corporate governance, I suggested a compromise. Luke would be the nominal president, while the Thomas would remain the administrative assistant. This arrangement was designed to test Luke if he demonstrated genuine commitment and earned the respect of the staff. We would then consider starting the legal process to officially make him the administrative assistant. However, we also prepared a contingency plan. If Luke proved unsuitable for the role, the options were clear. Either his dismissal or the potential closure of the company, with Lily and the account manager ready to launch a new venture. Despite their hope, Lily was skeptical about any real change in Luke's character. 
and both the Thomas and Victoria held on to their belief in him until the moment he unjustly dismissed me. During our heated discussion, I reminded him, if you want to be a true leader and entrepreneur, you need to study hard and take good care of your employees. I've told you this many times. Luke, still not grasping the gravity of the situation, naively suggested it's not a big deal, right? We can just go through the procedures now. No. It's impossible, I countered. Our company offers stocks to employees who desire them, and most of them own shares. Sophia owns 15% making her a major shareholder. We can't simply overlook her opinions, nor can we ignore the other employee shareholders who are unlikely to support you. As the reality of the situation sank in, Luke's face turned pale. I could have stocks too, right? He asked hesitantly. You would have, I replied. I was planning to transfer my shares to you once you proved yourself as a true leader. I'm deeply disappointed in you. It seems you were only after the wealth, not the responsibility that comes with it. In a room heavy with tension, the Thomas, weakened and weary, slumped in despair. Beside him, Victoria's face was etched with sadness. Defiantly, Luke, the president, retorted, of course, I'm the eldest son. What's wrong with taking what I can from the company? It's mine, after all. I could no longer hold back my disappointment and frustration at his brazen attitude. No, Luke, that's not how it works, I countered firmly. The Thomas, your father, is the administrative assistant and holds the ultimate responsibility for the company. And don't forget I'm a shareholder. I can call for a shareholders meeting and push for your dismissal. The word dismissal struck Luke like a bolt, draining the color from his face. You mean I might get fired? He stammered in disbelief. Yes, Luke, even though you dismissed me as just an office worker, I have rights here. I stated plainly. At this point, Victoria finally spoke, her voice filled with regret. Sophia, I owe you an apology. I'm truly sorry for the trouble caused by my misplaced love for my son. Please tell us what you would like to do. I looked Luke straight in the eyes. I can no longer work under you. I'm resigning effective immediately. However, I expect my severance pay and one month's salary, including compensation for all the unpaid overtime and holiday work. Furthermore, I'll be reporting our company to the Labor Standards Office. As a shareholder, I intend to fight to remove anyone who jeopardizes the integrity of this company. As I spoke, Luke's face turned from pale to ashen. I continued, Lily has already been reaching out to our clients and promoting our new venture. Most have decided to switch to the new company, and almost all our employees are prepared to follow. That's impossible. I'll sue you, Luke blurted out, nearly in tears. The Thomas, with a dismissive wave of his hand, corrected him. I am still the administrative assistant, Luke. You have no such authority. Overwhelmed, Luke collapsed to his knees. I felt a mix of pity and resolve. Mr. President, it's unfortunate it came to this. If only you had changed your attitude upon your return, none of this would have been necessary. There were plenty of opportunities for you to learn and adapt. In time, the Thomas made the difficult decision to close down the company. Luke found himself unemployed, and his attempts with his wife to sell corrective underwear failed, leading to their arrest for fraudulent activities. Lily, during a brief return home, discovered several boxes of unsold stock left behind. As for me, I joined Lily and the account manager at their new company. Every day at work is fulfilling, and I cherish the positive relationships I've built. Living and working with sincerity and integrity is my ongoing commitment, a stark contrast to the tumultuous environment we left behind.